Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. My name is Brandon Morrow. I'm an employee here at Ready Gunner. Uh, everybody calls me Beamer, like the car. I've been asked and uh, have the pleasure to moderate this event here at Ready Gunner. Our mission statement is creating a safer community by providing the means, training, and education to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. With that in mind, in the increase of mass shootings, we wanted to find a way to provide a platform where we can begin to understand the things we should be teaching our children and what we need to know should we ever find ourselves in one of these terrible situations. So, so tonight we brought in one of our local friends and experts, Todd Nielsen. Todd spent 25 years in law enforcement serving in special operations, narcotic enforcement, critical incident teams, rapid containment teams, and much more. He has served with the Secret Service Dignitary Protection Operation for Presidents Clinton and Bush. After retiring from public service, Todd created Nielsen Training and Consulting and has dedicated his time to training law enforcement officers, military contractors, and the personnel and the public. Not only does he train all over the world, but here in Utah, he is the Directory of Training at BPMF. Todd has multiple instructor certificates, and I'm sure after tonight's instruction, you will understand why we are so grateful to have him with us. Todd has prepared about 20 minutes of information he would like to start with throughout this entire event. Please feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. When Todd is finished with his prepared info, he will address as many of these questions as he can. So we'll turn our time over to Todd. There's 70 people. Oh. Hey, thanks, Beamer. Appreciate that. Um, thanks for the great introduction and everything. Let's kind of just start diving right into it. Um, active shooter events are just something that's going to become part of what's going to be our life nowadays. So the reality of it is we're just going to have to deal with it. And let's build a strong community so that we can either help prevent them, uh, like one that just happened in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, um, that I'll talk about a little bit later. But also we as citizens, how we can um, do our best to prevent an active shooter event, okay? So the FBI, they define an active shooter as one or more individuals actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a populated area. So it's rather vague, but it does allow us to think about and be prepared for any area that we might go into, okay? Obviously, the definition of a active shooter means that the person has a firearm. Because they have the firearm, that means that the shooting event can actually be changed in its outcome based on the responses that the people around them are giving them. Okay. One thing to think about, too, is that the FBI hasn't given a minimum number of casualties. However, the investigative assistant for violent crimes act of 2012 defines a mass killing as three or more killings in a single incident. So the FBI is kind of using that as the standard. Okay. As we go through this presentation, what I want you to do is start posting your questions in the comments and I'll get to them as soon as we can. And I hopefully I'll be able to answer everyone's direct question. So keep them posted throughout the, uh, throughout the presentation that I'm going through here. Some of the things to think about uh, for this, back in 2000 is when the FBI actually started doing their data analysis of active shooter events. And in 2000, we only had three active shooter events. However, 2010, we had our highest, okay? And that was 27 different shooting events or active shooter events. However, in 2011, it dropped down to 13, okay? So we kind of do the roller coaster and then through uh, 2012 to 2016, we stayed pretty, pretty consistent right around 20. Then 2017, we had 31. Okay. And then 2018 and 2019, we only had 30 each, uh, each year. However, in 2020, we all know what started happening in 2020. We actually went up to 40 events. So we're starting to see kind of an uptick in that. In 2021, however, we had 60 events. Okay, that's our highest ever that we've ever had. The good thing is from 21 to 22, we've had a 10.1% decrease and have only had 50 in 2022. However, based on the statistics that we have right now, for 2023, we're probably looking around the 40 to 
uh, 50 range, somewhere in there for the amount of active shooter events that we're gonna have across the United States. Now, every time that we talk about these, everyone thinks that they actually happen at schools at, on a regular basis, okay? Here's the realities. Back in 2005, the FBI started tracking the locations of where active shooter events happened, okay? So they have an, what they list as an other. So they, are, they're, they don't really delineate what the other is. They had 28 of, as, that they list as other um, events. The surprising part of this is that there were 17 that occurred at medical facilities, okay? Somebody decided they wanted to go shoot up a hospital, okay? The other part, and this is something that we see in the news media, and you'd think the media would actually portray it the, the proper way. However, houses of worship, we've only had 18, okay? The other surprising part that I found in doing the investigations of this stuff is that there were actually 23 in the last 22 years that happened at private residences, Okay, remember that's three or more people killed in, an, in one event. Okay, now the FBI also has what they call open space. So open space is gonna be anything where you go to like a festival, uh, an art festival, a wine festival, um, or um, a music festival or something like that. They call those open spaces. This is the surprising number, 102. At 102 active shooter events, at open space uh, environments. And remember, those are open to the public where the public can go back and forth and do anything that they need to do there. They just happen to be in that area. Now we have 38 that occurred in government facilities. Government facilities could be courthouses, could be post offices, could be a military base um, or a, um, a smaller base, okay? Now here's, here's another piece of reality. Education facilities, there were only 68, only 68. Very surprising when uh, we totaled up those numbers. However, the number that really shocked me was the 166 that we've had at places of commerce. So that's an open business where people can come and go freely and they're there to patronize something that's going on in that particular business in a contained space, 166 of those. Now, since 2000, um, we've had 484 active shooter events that are defined by the FBI. The sad statistic of all of this is 74% of those occurred in gun-free zones. All right, the FBI, back in 2000, after the Columbine stuff, which was in April of 1999, by the way, um, they came up with a program called Run, Hide, Fight. The great thing about run, hide, fight is it allowed you to be able to do the things that you needed to do to either get out of the area, to hide from the shooter or fight the shooter. The problem that we run into is that there are very few people that are actually going out there like Fight Back Nation that are out there actually teaching people to fight back. Okay, so here's the realities. If you need to run, get out of the area in any means possible. If you need to go through tunnels, go through tunnels. If you need to go through emergency exits where the general public isn't allowed, go through the emergency exits, okay? Call 911 when it's safe for you to do so. Don't try and call 911 while you're trying to get out of the area. Just get out of the area first. Now, one of the big things that could happen is you could run into law enforcement as they're responding to the area. If you're a concealed carry holder, do not have your firearm in your hands at the time that you come in contact with law enforcement. If you do, drop it immediately. Get your hands up so that you can no longer show that you're a threat to the law enforcement entities. You got to remember, they're going to be a little hyped up about everything that's going on. So you want to make sure that you're not presenting yourself as a threat. All right, let's talk about hide. If you're going to hide, you need to make yourself completely invisible to the shooter. And in doing so, what you need to do is get out of that little area or that immediate space that you're at. If all you can do is cover yourself up with um, some debris or some clothing, or even if it happens to be dead people, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get real real about this. If you have to use that to 
conceal yourself so that you don't get harmed or your family or your loved ones don't get harmed, then that's what you have to do. Okay. If you're able to get into a different room, lock the door and secure it. When I say secure it, I mean barricade it so nobody else can come in. Even if you hear somebody pounding on the door, let me in, let me in, let me, let me in, let me in, let me in, it could be the shooter. Okay. It's a reality of what's going on. Okay. Turn off the lights. Okay. Make sure the lights are off so that it looks dark like there's no one there. Okay. Another big thing, silence your cell phone. Turn it off. Don't be trying to talk on the cell phone to 911. I'm hiding in this room. I'm hiding in this room. Or calling your family. Hey, I'm scared. I'm doing this. Right now, your safety is paramount. You're going to need to focus on you. Make sure that everything is safe for you. Then call 911. Then call your family. Let them know what's going on. Make sure you understand what's the difference between cover and concealment. Okay? Cover stops bullets. And I'll get way more in detail on that. Concealment just hides you. That's all that it does. Now, fighting. Okay, very controversial subject, especially when you're talking about something like this here. If you're there with your family and your loved ones, then how are you going to actually fight? Your question. Okay, you're going to have to come up with some way of making sure that you can fight back and make sure that you're gonna be effective in fighting, okay? First and foremost, you gotta have a plan, okay? Even if it's a hasty plan, it's still better than no plan at all, okay? If you decide that, hey, I can hear the shooter coming, I'm gonna jump on their back and I'm gonna start pounding on the back of their head, okay, cool, execute that plan. Or I'm gonna go up, I'm gonna grab the gun and I'm gonna take the gun away from them while somebody else jumps on there and starts beating them up, okay? Because literally you're probably gonna to have to beat that person up. It's all right, okay? One of the things that I come in contact with a lot where people ask me, well, I don't know if I could harm this person. Well, the realities are this. You need to let mama bear and papa bear loose and take care of that problem because if that person wants to harm you or harm someone you know, love, and care about that's with you, you're gonna have to address that threat. And the realities are, it's on you. You're gonna have to fight like that third monkey gone Noah's Ark, okay? now. I also need you to understand that if you carry a concealed weapon, you need to know how to use it and you need to know and understand the ballistics and all that kind of stuff. And we'll get a little bit more in detail about that. Okay. But also understand you can look around that room that you're in and find weapons of opportunity, fire extinguishers, hoses, cords. I can choke somebody out with a cord. Okay. I can get a piece of plastic and I can jab it in their eyes. I can take a piece of a pen and I can jab it into their eyeballs. Okay. Just some things to think about. All right. Ultimately, what it's going to take for you to get prepared to deal with an active shooter event is you're going to have to think about all this stuff prior to it actually happening. It's a sad thing that we have to actually think about this stuff. And I wish we didn't have to, but the realities are it's just going to have to be what it's going to be. So let's start thinking about it and going through some what if situations right now. The way that I would start your pre preparations for this, I'd sit down and discuss with my family members and my loved ones, hey, this is what I think we should do. This is some of the things that I'm seeing that's happening in the world today. So let's sit down and have a conversation about it. And you need to have that relationship with your family members already where you're able to actually sit down and talk about this kind of stuff, okay? Another thing you can do is talk with school administrators um, at your children or your child's school, okay? One of the biggest things that I tell people all the time is you need to be aware of your surroundings. And I'll get in great detail about that, but you need to be aware of what's going on around you so that you can see something and react to it rather than all of a sudden it's surprising you and hitting you like a brick, okay? Another big piece of this is to stay physically fit, okay? You don't have to look like the Statue of David, but we'll get into that, okay? You need to know and understand how to use your tools. If you carry an impact weapon, if you carry a taser, if you carry a firearm, if you carry pepper spray, if you carry a knife, 
you need to know and you know how to use those tools and how to use them legally. Okay. Then the big one is you need to know and understand the legal ramifications that if you get involved, how and what is going to happen. And we'll get into great detail about all those. All right. So let's talk about discussions with your family members. Okay. Because I'll be honest with you, this is probably the hardest one for most people because this is such a emotional topic for people to deal with. Okay. Um, Make sure that you're having this conversation that's age appropriate for your children, okay? And make sure that you take the time to explain to them that you're going to do everything in your power to protect them, and you just want them to know and understand that you're doing this to protect them, and that's the only reason why you're talking about it, okay? A big thing that you can do to help them, to comfort them, is just acknowledge their fears, just explain to them, hey, I understand that you're scared, but mom, dad, I'm going to do everything that I can to protect you. Look, I've gone through this class. I've did this training. I did this piece here to prepare myself to make sure that I can protect you. Okay. Major, major thing that you can do. Teach your children that it is okay to fight back against their attackers. Okay. This doesn't go for just an active shooter event. This also goes for kidnappings. I did a lot of human trafficking stuff. So that's a major part of my life where I teach my kids so that they're prepared, know how to fight. Even my littlest one, she knows how to fight. And I'll tell you what, I don't want to scrap with her. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the big things that I always tell people that if your child is old enough and you feel that they're ready for um, some type of device, a telephone or um, one of the little watches for the kids now that they have, keep the location tracker on it. That way you always know exactly where that item is or that person is. I know my teenagers, they don't go anywhere without their phone. They can't breathe without that thing. So if you have the, lo the location tracker on it, you know exactly where they are and you can pinpoint exactly what's going on with them. Now, my family, we've developed code words. I'm not gonna share those with you because they're for my family. However, you can develop code words for, we need to leave this area, okay? Or let's go to the, let's go to the truck, let's go to the car. For us, our re reunification plan is simply, we're gonna go to Whatever location that got us or whatever vehicle got us to that location, that's how we're going to get together. And that's where we're going to uh, get together if we become separated. So you need to come up with that kind of stuff and start planning that beforehand. If you go to a grocery store, something happens at the grocery store. How are you going to deal with that? Develop that plan now before anything starts to happen. Okay. Now, the hot topic thing. What do I do if an event happens at my child's school? Now, I'm going to be 100% honest here. Four weeks ago, we had a false alarm at my child's high school. Okay. What do you think I went and did? Because I guarantee you, I did not go there. I sat there with my phone in my hand and went, okay, what can I do? Right now, law enforcement is responding. I could hear all the sirens. And the high school is four miles away. Okay. So best thing for you to do, go stage about a mile to two miles away. That way, first responders have all kinds of room to get in any equipment that they need to, but you're still close enough that you can respond if you need to. Okay. What if this happens at your spouse's work? Okay. Let's think about that for just a second. All of a sudden, flip on the news and you see your spouse's work, and you see an active shooter event that's happening right there. Develop a plan with your spouse on how to communicate that you're okay or you're not okay, okay? Could be something as simple as I call you and I hang up right away. That tells you that I'm okay. That way it's not tying up the cell phone system. It's not doing anything to um, hurt our first responders or get in the way of our first responders. If they don't respond, Again, you can go stage a mile, two miles away and stay out of the way of the first responders and then keep trying on the cell phone, okay? Now, 
you need to discuss this with your babysitters and any family members that may come in to visit with you and all that too, because something may happen when they're with your children. Your children aren't know how to react because you've already trained them. So get them prepared for that. Okay. And make sure outside family members, extended family members, when they come to stay at your house or they travel together, make sure that they know and understand how to deal with that. Same thing with any babysitters that you have. All right. Another big thing about this, teach your children to follow the school protocols. It is national law that every single public school has some type of protocol on how to handle an active shooter event. Every single school has that. Um, it's codified law. It has to happen. So teach your child to follow the rules and the protocols that, you're, that their school is already going through. Okay. Huge thing about this. I'm a gun guy. Okay. All my kids know daddy carries a gun all the time. So they know how I use my gun and they know that if daddy's gun comes out, they know exactly what to do. Teach your children the same thing. All right, let's talk about uh, talking to schools or talking to your school administrators, okay? One of the biggest things that you can do is volunteer at your child's school. Volunteer. Don't have to do it all the time. Do it once a month. Make sure that your child's teacher knows who you are. That opens up the door for you to be able to communicate with them. Get involved with all the sports activities or any after-school events. Chess club, get involved with it. If they're into sports, get into the sports stuff. If they're into any other thing that goes on with school, drama, dance, whatever it is that goes on at an after-school event, get involved with it so that the administrators and everybody get used to seeing who you are, especially you protectors out there. And if you're in law enforcement or you're military and you, you want to keep up, keep up with your military or your um, protector stuff, keep in contact with your school administrators and make sure that they know who you are. Okay. Also get to know who your children are talking to, who your children are hanging out with when they're on their breaks or when they're on lunch breaks or anything like that. Okay. Then we can sit down and have a conversation with the child's teacher. Okay. Ask them if they, if they have a concealed carry permit. Ask them if they carry on campus. Ask them if they legally can. Ask them if they're doing it illegally. Ask them if they have a plan. Ask them if they have a plan to barricade the school. Ask them if they have a plan to barricade their classroom. Ask them if they have a plan to protect your child. These are simple little things. However, it's very hard to initiate that conversation if you haven't developed that rapport already. Okay, because I guarantee you, you're just coming in and just hardballing them and asking these questions. They're going to start to think that that's just a little weird. However, start to build that relationship and you can actually be there at your school protecting your children and all the other children around there. Okay, now you can talk to the principal and I'll be very direct with the principal. What's the active shooter protocols? What, what should my child be expected to do? What are the teachers expected to do? What are you going to do when law enforcement responds? How is law enforcement going to respond? Where are they going to stage? How are they going to stage things up? I'm probably the worst guy that would go to a school and talk to administrators. And uh, my school administrators for my children have been very, very good about answering my questions. And I'm very direct about it. They, once they figure out my background, they're like, oh, okay, you're just asking because of this. Okay. Be direct about it and just tell them, hey, you want to know now. Another key thing is ask them about their reunification plan, okay? If they have to lock down the school and you have to come and get the, your children from the school, what is their plan to get them back to you, okay? Do they have a list of people that are authorized to come and pick up your child? So things to think about. Is it just mom and dad that can come pick them up? Can a brother come and pick them up? Can a sister? Can an aunt? An uncle, a grandma, a grandpa, who's on that list? Talk to your principal and find out how that all works because every single school is going to have their own different reunification program that's specific for their school and how they want to do it. Okay. Now, school boards. You guys pay attention here. If you're on the school board, sorry, I'm going to do a little slamming on you guys. It is your responsibility to make sure that your school district and everyone in your school board is practicing their 
active shooter training and everything like that. If they're not doing it, we as parents, we can hold the school board accountable. Remember, we vote them in. And if you don't like the way that they're doing it, go become part of the school board. And then you get to dictate how that's all gonna go. You as a parent can actually help with all that. Get involved with your PTA, same thing. It's amazing how much power you will have as a parent then when you're on the school board and you're doing stuff to protect your children. Now, as a side note, coming from the cop that's been involved with this stuff for almost 23 years of my life. When you send your kids to school, put some snacks in their backpack, put an extra bottle of water, because here's the reality. If their classroom has to go into a lockdown, they're gonna be in there for several hours. It's gonna take at least three hours for, them, for law enforcement to come in and clear that entire school. Having a snack and having stuff that they're used to always having helps calm them down. One of the greatest things that I ever saw teaching a Fight Back Nation uh, course, the teacher had a bag of dum-dums that were only for lockdowns. She would just give them to all the kids. Having that, having that little piece of sugar in their mouth, calm them down. And it's amazing how quickly and how awesome it is to make that whole scenario become so much better. All right, here's a big one. Being aware of your surroundings. Okay. You guys are gonna hate this. And some of you may be on it right now. Put your stupid phone down. When you're out with your family, put it down. Look around, see what's going on around you. Pay attention to the people that are around you. Notice the people that are walking by you. Notice the people that are walking around you, okay? Try and make eye contact with each one of them because it's funny how it intimidates those people that want to do harm to people. And that's not even just for active shooter events. That's for kidnappings and uh, people that want to do you violence also, okay? Now, as you're walking through a public area, notice where the exits are. Okay, think about, okay, if something were to happen right now, how do I get out of this area? Where was the nearest exit that I just saw? How do I get out of this little spot? Okay, it's great to have friends. Bring friends with you whenever you go to a public place. That way you've got another set of eyes that are looking around and seeing the things that you're not seeing, okay? Now, pay attention to your gut feelings, okay? Your gut will tell you, hey, that little quivering in your stomach that, hey, I don't want to be here, or I, I, something's not right, I should probably leave. Pay attention to those. And for the ladies out there, don't be afraid to be rude, okay? Guys get pretty good at this, but ladies, for some reason, they feel that they need to be nice and kind to people. If someone's giving you that feeling of, hey, I don't need to talk to you, simply tell them, hey, you know what, I'm sorry, I'm, I just don't want to continue this conversation, and I'm going to leave now. If they decide to follow you, now you've got a different situation. Okay, at least now you know that this, prop, this person is not listening to what you said. And a good stern voice turning around telling him, do not follow me or I will call the police. That works. Okay. I know because a number of my clients have already done that. All right. Anytime that you're sitting down in an environment, try and have your back to something that will protect you. A pillar, a wall, or something like that that conceals you so that you can see everything that's going on around you. It's funny when my wife and I go to dinner, it's not even a discussion anymore. I get my, my back goes to the wall and I do all the protecting. It's just, it is what it is, okay? The other thing is understand cover and concealment and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. Now, please, your car is not a holster. Carry your firearms on you. Carry your impact weapons on you. Carry your blades on you. Carry them on your person. That way, if you get separated from your bag, you have it with you. Please do me a favor and do that. All right, let's talk about being physically fit. Okay, like I said, you don't need to look like the statue of David. <clears throat> However, going for a walk, 20 minute walk every single day. It's amazing what it can do for your mental acuity um, and your physical abilities. Okay. Cause the big thing here 
is to remember that under a stressful situation, your heart rate could elevate an additional 90 beats a minute over your resting heart rate. For some people, that could push you over 150 beats a minute, which makes you almost tachycardic, which means that you're about to have a, a heart attack, okay? Another thing to remember, people that are in better physical shape or in better physical conditioning are, have less chances of being injured um, or killed in an active shooter event. That being said, if you're on an airplane or something like that, it could make you a target. So if you're looking physically fit and everything, wear a baggy sweatshirt or something like that whenever you're in a public space and that will allow you to not be targeted. All right. Kind of one of the general rules that I tell people to think about is think about having to sprint 100 yards and then being able to formulate a sentence. So formulating a sentence of the shooter's right over there and they're wearing a red shirt with black pants and black shoes and I don't know anything else. Can you say that after sprinting 100 yards? So your physical conditioning could be something as simple as sprint 100 yards and say four sentences, okay? Be something as simple as that. All right, if you have small children, there's a cool game that you can play. I call it the Zoomies, okay? Especially if they're in strollers. You can just go, hey, look, we're gonna play Zoomies. Everybody ready? You gotta stay as close to me as you can, but I'm gonna zigzag around a bunch of people and we're gonna have a lot of fun doing this, okay? And it's probably gonna make a few people in the mall mad, but you know what? This is just training for them in play. So, hey, we're going to play Zoomies. So we're going to go way over there and see if you guys can keep up with me and get them to follow with you. And then when an active shooter event actually happens or something happens where you need to get them out of the area, you go, hey, let's play Zoomies. They already know. They're keyed into it and off they go. They know, follow you wherever you go. That's where they go. Something cool. And it's a fun little thing that you can do. My kids loved it. All right. The big part of this, you've got to learn and practice your defensive skills. Your defensive skills could be a whole number of different things. Okay. They could be hand-to-hand -hand stuff. They could be knife stuff. Could be impact weapons. Could be firearms. All of, you got to make that personal decision as to what it is that you actually want to use. All right. Got to know, like I just said, you got to know how to use your tools. Hand-to-hand -hand skills, got to learn them, okay? Do you understand weapons of opportunity? Obviously, in this room, I've got all kinds of stuff at my disposal, okay? However, off-camera, there are tons of things that I could use as impact weapons. There's all kinds of cordage around where I could choke somebody out. There's plenty of sticky, pokey things that I could jab into somebody's eyeballs, um, jab into their throat, jab, in, jab into their neck, and all that kind of good stuff, okay? You carry impact weapons, do you carry knives, do you carry firearms, okay? Carry them on your person. All right, let's talk about cover and concealment. This is a big thing. So a thing to think about is four inches of concrete will stop most handgun rounds, okay? Four inches of concrete will stop most handgun rounds, okay? Six inches of concrete will stop almost every single uh, rifle round that's out there. Okay, the 338 and 50 cals, yeah, okay. Nobody's done any active shooter event with a 338 or a 50 cal because number one, they're just too heavy to, yield, to wield around and the ammunition is stupid expensive, okay? So if you think about things from that perspective, six inches of books will stop most handgun rounds, okay? So barricading a, uh, a doorway with a bookcase is a great thing to do because then it also makes it ballistic. All right. Let's talk about the legal ramifications, all the real fun stuff um, that's going to happen. Okay. First and foremost, you got to make your peace with your God, your deity, or whoever it is that you pay homage to, that you're okay, that if you put somebody down, you're okay with that. Or if you maim them for the rest of their life, you're going to be okay with that. Okay. Another thing to think about if you're carrying a firearm, what if you hit an innocent party? Are you mentally prepared for that? Okay. Right now, current things are about 2.4 million for a wrongful death case. 
Are you prepared for that? Okay. With that, get personal liability insurance. There's tons of ones that are out there. I'm personally a USCCA guy. However, you guys do the research, find out which one works best for you. Okay. Big thing that you need to know and learn and understand is what the codified law for your specific area is. And when I say specific, it could be for your city, it could be for your county, or it could be for your state or, or uh, court jurisdictions. Okay, so you've got to know and understand what those laws are and what the ramifications are of those laws and when you can use force and everything like that. We teach a bunch of that stuff at BPMF, okay? Then you got to make the, the decision and I would encourage you to decide and make that now. Make that today, whether or not you're going to get involved in an active shoot fence, because I'll be 100% honest with you. If I'm with my family, I'm getting my family out of there. If it's just me, I'm going to work. That's just the way it is. Big part of this too, is to understand you could be arrested. Okay. Even though, yeah, you did the great thing, you stopped the active shooter and everything else, but you still could be arrested. Go through that process, listen to what the law enforcement are telling you to do, do exactly as they say to do, and then we can get through and plead your case after everything settles down, all the shooting has finally stopped, and then we can sit there and have a discussion while the police are doing their investigation. Okay, Can't preach this enough. Once law enforcement arrives on scene, do exactly as they say. Even if you're not the shooter, do exactly as they say. If they say, put your hands up on your head, put your hands up on your head. If they say, put them behind your head, put them behind your head. If they say, just lift them up, lift them up. Just do what they say. That way they know that you're not a threat. You've got to remember, they're people too. And when they're responding to these events, it's just as crazy and dangerous for them as it is for you. All right. I know there's tons of questions about some of the stuff that we, that I just kind of lightly talked on. So let's get into a bunch of questions. Beamer, I know there's been a couple that have been popping up there for you. All right. Um, yeah. And if you have a question, just do me a favor, just type it in um, and we'll get to every single one of them that we possibly can, because this is important. And, and I guarantee you that if you're thinking it, somebody else is too. So please put it in the comment section there so that we can actually get those things answered for you. Because to be honest with you, I want you to have the information so that you can formulate what's best for you specifically. All right, Todd, before we get into some questions and this will kind of buy, uh, as well as we'll buy some time for some of the audience, uh, okay. we briefly talked about your experience and your expertise very briefly in the opening <laughs> uh monologue would you like to elaborate on that further your experience and expertise yeah so i did 25 years with the san jose police department doing narcotics prostitution future of apprehension human trafficking active shooter events uh crowd control events and all that kind of stuff i was actually one of the um people that helped set up the protocols for the santa clara county um and also did one of the one of the only ones that i know of to date where we did a full exercise with EMS, fire, the teachers administration, the teachers and students where we did a full mock of, hey, this is what would happen at an active shooter event with response times and everything else. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we gleaned from this, one of the hardest things to do from the law enforcement perspective was to sit by and wait because we had to wait the two minutes of what our response time would have been to get in there and actually go take care of the shooter and eliminate that threat. And that was one of the things that all of us guys that were on the teams at the time were talking about where, holy cow, that waiting that two minutes was the absolute worst for us to sit there and go through to just get there. So you've got to remember that law enforcement is going to respond to that location and their anxiety levels are going to be amplified because they are doing everything that they can to get there and take care of that problem to protect you and your loved ones. Okay. Thank you. Sure. We, um, I briefly mentioned it in our, in my opening statement and you had mentioned it, I think about 10, 15 minutes ago. What is BPMF? 
BPMF is my, uh, my training center. Uh, B the Chase Movement BPMF Training Center is in Springville where we do everything from, I've never touched a gun um, and I'm afraid of guns to hand to hand, virtual, uh, virtual firearms training, uh, legal updates, um, beginning level firearms training, um, high end firearms training. So you start doing your home defense courses and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have several people there, uh, Patrick Odell from Modern Civilian Combat. He does all of our hand-to-hand -hand and our knife fighting skills. Um, great courses that he teaches for anyone that wants to just learn to master your hand-to-hand -hand stuff or your knife fighting or even your stick fighting or other impact um, weapons. We, and we do that right, right here in Springville, Utah. Does uh, BPMF or um, any other organization or anything that you're associated with have any sort of technology available that can help with schools in an active shooter scenario? Yes, uh, um, I consult with a number of um, companies that do stuff for active shooters and, and to prevent active shooters. Uh, one of them, there's a, an application that once they purchase it, um, a teacher on any device that's uh, tied into their, the school's network, they can literally push a button and say active shooter at this location, it will geolocate where that button was pushed. And then it immediately goes out to law enforcement and EMS. So it eliminates the dispatch part of it. So in law, law enforcement terms, basically that just made it a three minute faster response time. So with that application, they can actually take pictures and load them into it automatically. As soon as they take the picture from the app, it goes into that scenario and becomes part of the evidence uh, train that they utilize so that they can take pictures of the, the shooters right here. This is what's going on. Um, the cool thing about that is, is teachers can sit there and type in um, just, like on a, just like a text message. The shooter just passed my classroom. He tried my door and continued moving on. That tells law enforcement that that's where they're at, even though there isn't any actual shooting going on. So that application is huge and that goes out to all law enforcement. And the cool part about it is once the school district purchases that particular application, they give it to uh, police, fire and EMS. So all the first responders for free. It's an amazing, amazing application. Um, and there's a few things that I'm working on behind the scenes with attorney generals and everything to kind of make that a state mandate across or a national mandate across the United States. Um, I can't give up the actual name of it yet, um, but if you do some research into AIM, you might be able to find something like that. Uh, you had briefly touched on this earlier, and we got a question about concealed carry insurance. I wrote down that you had mentioned USCCA. Um, do you utilize any others? Have you worked with others, or are you pretty happy with USCCA? Um, I'm happy with the USCCA. There's uh, five or six different ones that are out there. The NRA has one. Um, law, U.S. Law Shield's out there. Um, the biggest thing you need to do is look at the policy and find out what is specifically good for you. Just like any other insurance, you can take a recommendation from me. However, you need to look at the policy to make sure that it fits your needs specifically. Thank you. Um, what is the end goal of asking teachers about concealing in their own personal preparations? What does a no answer tell me and what does a yes answer tell me? Okay, so a no answer tells me that I need to probe more. Um, is it because of a personal choice that they just don't like firearms? Um, because here's a reality. I've asked several teachers this, um, especially teachers that have a concealed carry permit. Are you going to be okay mentally, physically, emotionally, that if it's one of your students that you have to take down in order to stop the threat? That's a huge thing. That's a mindset thing that we have to work through um, with our teachers when we're training them to let them know that, hey, this is a possibility. Now, if the teacher says yes, that's my next question. Are you okay having to put down one of your students or a former student? So these are things that you just need to kind of start building on and then ask them, well, how are you going to utilize that firearm in order to protect my child? And what are your skill sets? What's your background? What's your training? 
Okay. If I were a teacher, I'd be, I'd be an outstanding person to have as a concealed carry holder as a teacher because of my training, my background and my experience. However, I'm not a teacher, so. Okay. The next question is a great question that I think actually affects a lot of people who have day-to-day -day jobs. Uh, yeah. what, what do you suggest? What, what do you have a plan formula? What do, you, what, what do you suggest if your work doesn't let you carry if that's an official policy of your employer? Um, it, it's a tough one and it's a real sticky subject because uh, as an employer, they probably don't want to have a firearm on campus. Um, here in the state of Utah, you cannot forbid a concealed carry holder from carrying at work. However, they can mess with you by their, uh, their policies and say, well, you're violating our policy and you could actually end up being terminated. So what I personally would do is sit down and have a conversation with them. Um, and I've had this conversation with a few other places that I've worked. I go, look, here's my background, here's my training, here's my experience, and just lay it out for them. And this is my intention. I don't have any intention to do anybody harm. If somebody wants to come and rob the store and they're just going to take the money and leave, great, cool. I'll let them take the money and leave. If they're going to come in and start shooting the place up, then we have a problem. And that's something where with my background, my training and my experience that I'll get involved. And that's, that's another thing that you're going to have to make that decision. What level are you willing to get involved? If, it's a physical altercation. Are you willing to get involved with that? Um, if it's a verbal altercation, do you want to just sit and observe? Or do you want to go, hey, you know what? Go take that someplace else. So there's a whole different, a whole bunch of different things that you can do. And if you come to one of our uh, law update classes, we, we start talking about those types of scenarios where you can kind of expand on it and just kind of build your training on that. And then also one of the big things, play what ifs with yourself. Hey, what if this happened with me right now? What would I do? Where could I go? How would I handle this? What are my options? What are my legal options? What are my moral options? So on and so forth. Okay, we're moving along. The next one online uh, build itself as a tough question. What can I do as a parent in a case like Uvalde where it seems though, as though the police are actively oh. doing nothing but my children are inside? Okay, let's talk about Uvalde first. Okay. Uvalde was a error of things that happened at least four years prior. Okay. So the realities of it are the city council did not hold the law enforcement um, accountable for their training. The citizens did not hold the city council accountable for the law enforcement training. The chief of police did not hold his officers accountable for their training. The officers did not hold themselves accountable to get the most updated training. So the realities of all that are, be, hold your law enforcement, your city councils, I mean, all your uh, political leadership, hold them accountable for what happens for your law enforcement's training. If they are not going to give them a budget to take care of that training, demand to know why. Okay. Now, Uvalde, I'll be 100% honest with you. If it were my child that was in that classroom, the first thing I'd have grabbed is about five cops that looked like meat eaters and go, we're going in there and we're going to go take care of this problem. Body armor or not, I'd been in there taking care of the problem. Okay. Have I made my peace with, uh, with God and everybody about me losing my life to defend someone else? Yes, I'm okay with that. However, you need to make that same peace with yourself and your. Uh, God, your deity, or whoever it is that you pay homage to. So as far as Uvalde goes, it was a complete errors from the citizens uh, of Uvalde all the way up to the city council, the chief of police, and the chief of police down to the, to the command and all the way down to their officers and any other officer that was responding there. It all starts with their citizens holding them accountable to make sure that they get the training and they're gonna act appropriately in situations like that. Another online question. Uh, this one is probably uh, definitely affects Utah here with it being a pretty faithful, actively faithful state. What tips for churches and any, you know, church goers and any ch uh, tips for church leaders? Church leaders. Um, you know who your law enforcement entities are. Um, you know who your paramilitary organizations are, your security people, and so on and so forth. Reach out to them. 
and have a discussion, have a very frank discussion with them about, hey, if something were to happen, do you carry your firearm at church? Yes, I know the rules are that you don't carry a firearm at church. However, there are exceptions for law enforcement. Okay, have that discussion. So those of you that are in leadership, have that discussion with your constituents to see if that's what they're willing to do. If they're willing to do it, great. How many people um, within your congregation are there that can actually do that particular task? Building this stuff up now and thinking about all that stuff now is the time to take care of it, not after an event happens, okay? Like I said, there were 18 uh, shootings at houses of worship, okay? I can guarantee as things start to progress through the violence of this summer, or at least for what I see coming this summer, that there are going to be more houses of worship that are going to be attacked. So if you're in leadership in a church, and I don't care what denomination it is, it is your responsibility to seek out those people that have the capabilities to make sure that your congregation is safe. That falls on the leadership. If you prohibit them from having the tools that they need, 100% that falls on you. And I'm a very faithful man, and I, I do believe in the power of uh, the Almighty and that he will do everything he can to protect us. However, we also need to do our part. Kind of briefly, not sort of, but talked about it with Zoomies earlier, but uh, in the situational, uh, this situation, what, did, what, did you, what do you teach your kids to do if they see you pull your sidearm or your firearm out? Um, the first thing that I want them to do is get down on the ground um, and get away from me because it could be something where I need to draw the attention of the shooter towards me. So I want them down low and moving and I'm going to get as tall as I possibly can and I'm going to aggressively move towards that shooter. Um, and that's a lot of my training uh, and my background. That's just what I do. Um, and it's not something where you're going to, it's a one and done type class. It's something where you're going to have to practice those skill sets on at least a weekly basis to be able to move and shoot accurately 100% of the time, because the realities of this are that that shooter is also going to be moving and possibly shooting at you at the same time, unless you're so good that you can hit them with that first shot and incapacitate them. So got to keep those skills up and you've got to be able to um, uh, talk to your children and go, if daddy's gun or mommy's gun comes out, um, I need you to distance yourself away from me because that's what's going to happen. The gunfire is going to come towards you. Okay. And my kids, my kids know that. How do you suggest to get involved with helping with local PD uh, with active shooter mock drills? You can volunteer. Um, I know for a fact that anytime that law enforcement are looking, uh, when, whenever they do training at uh, schools or um, public spaces or anything like that, they're always looking for volunteers. And the best thing to do is just go talk to the chief, the chief of police secretary and ask him, hey, do you need volunteers? Because I want to help my local law enforcement. Even as a retired law enforcement, I still do that today. I'll still go over to the city of Springville, talk to Chief Haight and go, hey, what do you need volunteers for? Let's make it happen. Uh, we were talking about we were talking about some of these scenarios and situations earlier before this had started. And I had uh, we've been talking a lot about certain situations and cars and things of that. And you had asked me to ask you about grocery store parking lot. <laughs> so what about it? What's so you know, so remember places of commerce, 166 events out of 484. OK, as you go to your grocery store, I'm guilty of it, too, where, hey, I'm going to find the closest parking spot and I'm going to run in. I'm going to grab what I need to do and I'm going to get out as fast as I can. Do me a favor. Take 30 seconds. Drive through the parking lot. Make sure there's no heebie jeebies or bad gut feelings that you're getting or just some you look at some person and you go, I don't like the way that that person's looking at people. OK, here's the reality. In all my trainings, I teach people to be aware of everything that's going on around them and to do exactly that, drive around the parking lot and pay attention. I had a student of mine that called me up and goes, Todd, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe what just happened. And she proceeded to tell me about how she saw this guy that was only watching people as uh, watching only women 
as they're coming out of the store. And as they come out, he says he was watching her, just follow and watch and watch and watch. And then he sees a gal come out with her purse sitting right next to the child carrier in the front of the cart. And he follows in behind her and she goes, not on my watch. And she pulls in, parks her vehicle. As she sees her walking over to the vehicle, uh, to her vehicle, starts to open up the door just as the guy grabs the purse, starts to run, tries to pull away the purse, which is attached to the child carrier. So now we have a felony crime. My friend decides that today's the day. She pulls out her firearm, proceeds to plant it in the side of the person's uh, temple, um, knocking him to the ground. <laughs> and the cool part is the security officers were Johnny on the spot, saw everything on camera and came running over about 10 seconds later, handcuffed him just as the sirens were coming in from the police response because the security guard had already called the police. Amazing how everything fell together, but because she was paying attention to what's going on around her, she was able to thwart a robbery, which was going to turn into a kidnapping. So being aware of your surroundings, literally 30 seconds, 30 seconds is worth someone's life. Okay, we have time for one more question. What do you keep in your car with respect to active shooter situations? All right. Inside every single one of my vehicles, I have a trauma kit um, that has chest seals, uh, compression bandages, multiple tourniquets. Um, in the vehicle that I drive on a regular basis, I have two sets of chest seals, um, four compression bandage, one uh, major trauma dressing, um, four tourniquets, four emergency blankets, um, about a hundred ounces of water, so on and so forth, just because if someone were to get injured, once the threats are all over, because of my background, my, my experience, I'm going to start to render aid to those that are injured. And I know that in a mass casualty incident, I'm going to have to need more tools than what normal people would. And literally it's just one bag that I grab and go. Okay. Do yourself a favor, get some form of training. Okay, you can get it through, through me. Um, you can find me at nielsentraining.com or you can find me at BPMF, um, Be Present, Mindful and Fit, Inc.com. So BPMFINC.com. Or you can shoot me an email at either one of those, uh, Todd at BPMFinc.com or Todd at nielsentraining.com. Happy to ask any, answer any questions that you may have. If there's something else that you need to have, do me a favor, just shoot Ready Gunner a message um, if you can't get a hold of me, and they'll definitely get back to me and let me know what we can do to answer whatever question you may have. All right. I want to thank all of you for, for participating with us tonight, especially Todd for sharing his knowledge and his experience with us. This is such a Big topic, and we know it's actually impossible unless it's possible to cover everything. We have scheduled another free webinar for August 7th. We will be in touch with each of you when the time gets closer and hope you will join us again. And again, thank you, Todd. Thank you for joining us. Be safe. If you like this training, please visit us on Instagram at Ready Gunner and uh, leave a comment on our post. Uh, if you liked it, what we can improve on. Uh, thank you for joining us.